I guess the whole point of this whole thing is the idea that what learning is is really living your life in a way where you build a higher sense of reason than the one that you come in with. And what I mean by higher sense of reason is that you, you broaden your references, you broaden your experiences in order to operate from a more evolved point of view that takes into consideration more than our own tiny little skull-sized kingdoms. Um, that's why this is such a hard thing to do to lay out in a sort of linear fashion because every idea that I have, everything I want to talk about here, wants to branch off in lots of different directions at once. And that's because our, the way our, our language is, the way that we, we divide ideas into a series of words is exceedingly linear. And that really speaks to the notion that one thing always has to come before another. And this kind of idea is a lot more three-dimensional than that. This kind of idea is something that is better looked at. Um, asynchronously, that this is the kind of idea that is uh, more like a landscape, more like a, a three-dimensional area that can be explored and walked around and seen in lots of different directions at once, uh, because that's the nature of, of learning, that it's not this system or a process of one thing, then another, then another. You can learn things that way, and lots of times that's a great way to learn things. But that's the way you learn processes, and that's the way you learn uh, how to do something that you did not know how to do before. And I'm not saying that that's not useful. Clearly, that's a very useful thing. It's a sort of development of a skill or an ability. But learning in the sense that I'm talking about is a changing of your mind. It's a reforming of your mind, a hacking of your mind that is much more equivalent to the combined experiences and framing of experiences in a life more so than it is walking through um, step by step. So when you talk about it in school, this is one of the big problems with, with school as a place to learn is that when you talk about it in school, teachers have you for single subjects with certain outcomes over a certain amount of time, and that's all they can really touch. It's that linear world. It's that, that division of ideas into words. And maybe that's not efficient enough because dividing these things into words, dividing these things into certain points of view doesn't um, speak to this, this overarching notion of learning as uh, building a new landscape as broadening your reference, as raising your sense of reason and your sense of understanding. So they're doing their best, and, and you can put it all together, all of these different courses, all of these different lessons, and start to, to cobble together this, this, this body of broadening. Um, you know, you have one piece here, one piece there, you know, an arm, a leg, a torso of, of learning, and, and you, you're able to sort of fasten them in the right places at the right times. But that's really, again... That's the, the job of the student. And that's not something that the teacher can do. Um, we would like to think that we can uh, throw you through a thesis or a dissertation. And then now we want to zoom out and see the body of knowledge. We want to see how it all works together. We want to see all these parts. And you have to prove it now. But the truth of the matter is going through this whole schooling thing. I've, I've gone through a lot of school as that it's not very complete. And it's something that you looking back at your work, it should really be something that, that embarrasses you more than, than makes you super proud if you're to keep progressing. If, if school were the apex of your understanding, the apex of your learning, the apex of your skill building, you would look back at your, you know, your master's thesis, be it a painting or a book or um, an argument of some kind, and always live in the shadow of it. But really, within five, ten years, you should be able to look back at that and go, oh man, they gave me a degree for that? Really? I am so much better than that now. I'm taking an example from my life, I would say that in high school, the, the courses that, that I ran in high school um, probably required me to read a total of maybe eight books throughout my time in high school, maybe. And how many of those I actually read, I, I, I couldn't tell you. It wasn't eight. Um, several smaller than that. 
in college, um, for my bachelor's in English, I would say that I probably had to read somewhere in the neighborhood of, and I'm just ballparking, maybe maybe 25 books, maybe 30 books. Um, and how many of those did I read? Uh, I couldn't tell you, probably 15 or 20, in the nature of, of 50 to 60% of the ones I was supposed to read um, because of the way things were stacked and the way I was a kid and everything else. Then I would say that my master's degree, I can remember specifically, required me to read 50 books. And, and that's great. You know, 50 books is a nice body of, of uh, literature to get through in a couple years, especially when you apply it to study and whatnot. And, and uh, I really got something out of each one of those, and I did read all 50 of those books. Um, but this year, this calendar year, has been nine months long, about, and I've read 101 books. So if we're to equate reading with learning... Uh, which a lot of us do, and certainly in um, the the realm of English, though you would put more into a book than the, just the reading of it, uh, I've I've certainly expanded um, on on my practices over what I was doing in school, and I've had years and years to do that, uh, years to to get legs up on myself and to learn how to read faster and better and learn how to make time for it, and um, what I'm saying is I've I've built a much broader body of knowledge now, and I continue to build a broader body now than I ever could have done in school. But the other point here is this, that, that anything can be your teacher. Anything. It doesn't have to be a sort of set condition. We, we have this notion that it does, and again, this goes all the way back to the idea of the bed, that there's this one way that things should be, and, and this one sort of condition under which we learn best and this one sort of system of doing things, and it doesn't have to be that. Anything can be your teacher, and anything should be your teacher, and perhaps the best thing that you could learn in school or anywhere is the idea that you can learn under any circumstance from anything that you encounter, that a lot of it has to do with the framing and the processing and the meaning-making, and that that gets easier and easier as you broaden your sense of references and your sense of experience, that you're able to apply these things uh, more clearly to your own learning, to the, the polishing of yourself, to this improvement that we're hopefully striving for. And if anything can be learning, if anything can be your, your stage for learning, why not school? It does not have to be perfect. It does not have to tackle more than su one subject at a time, and it doesn't have to be anything other than done in this sort of linear language of, of things. May as well be school. Uh, in fact, if, if you're lucky enough to have things set aside to, to uh, be able to do school without other jobs and that kind of thing, well, then you've got no excuse but to use this as your teacher. That doesn't involve necessarily doing everything by the book as, as the classes would have you do, but as in integrating and investing parts of yourself into this. Um, it's a, a, a good little... Zen story. These these are really good for teachers. These different little Zen cones, where there was this village, and there was a the, a wise man in the village, and he was really into to meditation, and he wanted to, to to get deeper and deeper into it. So what he did was he he ventured off into the hills and into a cave where he could meditate without distraction. And so this monk came passing through, and he heard about this guy, and they said, oh, yeah, he's up in the caves, he's meditating up there, you know, no distractions. And the monk goes, oh, I see. So he walks on up to the cave, and he goes in there, and he just starts being irritating to this guy. He starts going, hey, man, isn't this great? All the townspeople come up and bring us food. We sure have them fooled. We're just hanging out here. It's like a bachelor pad. This is awesome. And it, it soon starts to grate on the, the wise man who's there to meditate, and he goes, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to concentrate here, and you're, you're bugging me. And the wandering monk says, Yeah, well, you should be able to meditate with me bothering you. That's the whole point. If you can't do this, um, this enlightening thing around your life and with your responsibilities and with distractions, what, what point is it? you got to go off and shut yourself off and be in a quiet space for this? Really? Now, certainly... Focusing your space and, and setting aside time and setting aside a place is um, uh, very beneficial for learning certain things and, and certain subjects very efficiently. 
but it's not what we always get to do. And so being able to adapt learning to your life is much more powerful. Now, when I say that anything could be your teacher, uh, my, my little um, subconscious um, editor comes up onto my shoulder and says, hey, what about traumatic experiences, dude? Don't guilt them about having traumatic experiences. Those don't help learning. Yeah, um, there are things that, that can really distract you from learning. And a lot of that is when you make limits for yourself or when somebody else makes a limit for you or when you embrace a limited ideology, embrace a point of view that cuts off branches of knowledge or um, is far too biased in one direction or another. And certainly the, in the world of experience, um, something traumatic can teach you the wrong thing. Um, through undoing that, through facing that, yeah, that can be your teacher, but that's not the way we like to go about things, is it? Um, one thing that makes learning really hard is getting around not the distractions around you, not the structure of schooling and not your job and your other responsibilities. It's getting around the infrastructure of your own mind. You would not believe how absolutely powerful cognitive dissonance is. Until you've really read a lot about it and studied it, cognitive dissonance is... is it, Okay, well, the definition of cognitive dis dissonance, this is a, a, a psychiatric definition, um, more or less, that it's when you've made a choice and you want to justify that choice. Um, so you're constantly telling yourself that this was the right thing to do, this was the right candidate to pick, this was the right job to take on, this was the right car to buy. So you change everything in your life and you change the framing of the things in your life to agree with that. But it goes so much deeper than that. Essentially, people don't change their minds. Your average person just does not change their mind. They are so dead set on a decision they've made or a way that they see themselves that they will filter out any information that disagrees with them. They will have the ability to ignore any fact that comes at them because cognitive dissonance has such a... Um, overarching and powerful influence on the way that your brain works. There's a fantastic book out there called um, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me that really goes into a lot of this. And one, one thing that, that uh, any person who's into the notion of neuropsychology likes to bring up is this story of um, brain bifurcation, of the, the way that our rational mind um, creates answers for ourselves and creates motivations for ourselves. So, so what this goes back to is uh, a study that was done in the 60s where they were looking at these patients who had really debilitating um, uh, epilepsy and they could not live a normal life uh, because of their epileptic um, seizures. And the only cure that they had at the time, which is extremely um, invasive cure, was to cut the part of the brain that um, links the left and right hemispheres together. And they weren't exactly sure why, but this seemed to work. This would stop these, um, these seizures from happening. But then what you have essentially at that point is, is two brains happening, two thinking mechanisms happening in your mind where one side is in control of things like your speech and your rational thought, and the other side is in, in charge of other uh, parts of your um, uh, being. Now, this sounds crazy, but they would do these experiments where um, they could essentially communicate something to one side of the brain and then ask the other side of the brain what's going on here. Um, just for example, uh, they would tell the patient to pick out a random object from a, a bowl of objects, and they would write down and show to the, the correct eye um, that what they were looking for was uh, a set of house keys. And the patient will pull out the house keys and they'd say, why did you pick out the house keys? And the side of their brain that's answering doesn't know that it was told to look for the house keys. And right there on the spot, it makes up an answer. It says, oh, well, I just saw these keys and it reminded me of my grandma's house. And uh, I just decided this was the item that I wanted to pick out of the bucket. It would just make up an answer right there on the spot. 
It didn't have to have a reason. It pretended there was a reason, and it just vomited one out. And this kind of thing, they just over and over, this was a highly repeatable experience. So they would tell the, the guy that, hey, when we tell you this, however they communicate this, don't make me pull out a book and look it up. They'd say, when we say this, we want you to stand up and go down the hall. And um, they would say it in this interview, and the guy would stand up and start walking down the hall, and they'd say, hey, uh, where are you going? And he'd go, oh, I was just going down the hall. I want to get a Pepsi. Just making up an answer. Our brains do this all the time. And uh, basically what's happening here is you have this little binary mechanism sort of in the base part of your brain that makes a decision. And then you have um, a fix to it, this other module on top of it that rationalizes that decision, that gives you a reason why you chose that decision. So basically anytime you ask somebody, hey, why did you get that tattoo? Hey, do you want to go to the park? Um, why didn't you make it to class today? Whatever. The answer they give is a rationalization of a decision that they made before it ever hit their conscious thought most of the time. It's a precognitive decision that we generally make. And this happens in the store all the time. And dude, I will get into it so hard with advertising at some point that advertisers basically want to link the resolution of some um, unspoken emotion inside of you, something that you hide away. They want to resolve that emotion by making a precognitive link between acquiring their product and the sating of that emotion. And you'll never know. You'll just think, hey, you know, I'm, I, I'm a tide guy. That's why I picked the tide. But really, it has to do with this, this precognitive decision that's been placed in your mind um, without your knowing. Hey, don't believe me. Just follow the money. Most of the money in the country is spent on advertising, and the highest paid people in advertising are um, neuropsychologists um, and anthropologists who uh, are able to hack into this whole mechanism and work with marketers in order to communicate it properly. Oh, it's effed, man. Completely. So really what I'm talking about is trusting these modules in your mind um, if, if, if you trust it too far, this is what coagulates or metastasized in, into certainty. When you accept a point of view, accept a, a dogma, accept a um, uh, teaching of any kind, um, a philosophy of any kind hard enough, then you're able to petrify everything that you do in your life around this. And it makes it where you're not accessible to broadening yourself and broadening that point of view. It makes you think that your anecdotal belief and evidence is somehow more powerful than, than the world around you. An example of that is, um, and I, I don't mean to get political with this at all, but it's and a good example is gun control. Because you have people who, who buy guns um, for safety, despite the fact that statistically speaking, you are safer without a gun in the house than you are with a gun in the house. And every single person who, who believes this believes that they are the exception to this. And this goes back to that rule of 125, that they haven't seen this happen. They haven't seen accidents with a gun. They haven't seen, um, you know, burglars break in and use the gun against you. They haven't seen suicides uh, from, from kids being able to access guns more easily than they should be able to. This hasn't crossed their, their experience threshold. This hasn't crossed the experience of their friends, the people they know. And so that statistic is meaningless to them. And they believe that this uh, will actually keep them safer, despite the fact that there is almost never any evidence that using a gun against an intruder is a reliable or effective method. In fact, um, statistically speaking, lamps are more effective than guns. Now, that's probably because more of us have lamps in the house than guns, but nevertheless, just like people who are scared of flying, Statistically speaking, it's way safer for you to be flying on a plane than it is for you to be taking an Uber, for example. And yet, there's something that, that feels um, much more familiar and safe about, about keeping your feet on the ground, um, so to speak. 
so these different modules in your head are are playing with your knowledge and they're they're playing with the way that you learn and if you allow them to close up around themselves if you allow them to um, become this uh, sort of like certainty mechanism and not allow in new things then you'll be just like everybody else and by everybody else you'll be someone who doesn't apologize well you'll be someone who does not change their mind even when introduced with new evidence um, you'll be someone who um, ceases to grow and becomes the product of everything that has happened to them up until that point. Now listen, your perception is great. Your perception tells you all sorts of neat stuff. Butterflies and rainbows and, and Mozart operas. I mean, all this stuff is great and your perception brings all of this in and they're, they're wonderful. And they, can, they can turn you on and they can make you alive. Um, but your perception also tells you that the world is flat. You and I don't stand here and, and perceive ourselves to be on a ball. Um, our perception tells us that when the sun or the moon is on the horizon, that it's much larger than it is when it's directly overhead. And it's not, and it doesn't even appear larger. That's just our, our um, mind telling us that our eyes are seeing it larger. I mean, our perception is so lame. Uh, there's this old saying that um, if, if you're looking at a camel, with two eyes, why are you just seeing one? It's because everything is an illusion. Everything is an interpretation. Everything is, is being filtered through the system of your mind. And to over-trust that without uh, taking in outside information, outside research, outside knowledge, is um, allowing yourself to metastasize and petrify and before you know it you'll be um you know a 17 year old or a 25 year old that doesn't grow beyond that point that instead grows into itself and allows itself to be more and more separate from the world around it rather than more and more integrated and understanding of the world and experiences around it and that's the opposite of learning Now, what we do know about learning in the brain is also counter to a lot of the conditions that we encounter in school. For example, we know that stress is really bad for learning. Stress um, has a tendency to push yourself into this survival mechanism in your brain, back into that lizard brain, that part of your brain that's scared of spiders and snakes and falling, um, back into survival mode. And... Your brain doesn't know the difference between being totally stressed out because of a looming threat to your body and between being totally stressed out because of the looming threat of not passing a class. And chemically speaking, it's experiencing that same trauma both times. Now, there's some something that we can uh, wield for this, and that's that we, we get a little shot of adrenaline and we get some chemicals running around in our brain, and it can increase our, our performance. So, for example, this is why a lot of people procrastinate. That without the stress there, they don't really know how to perform this task that is due, that they're supposed to be doing. They don't really know how to do it because they haven't really learned it. They've sort of shut it out. And then once that push comes to shove and the science project is due the next day and you're really stressed out, you get enough of a chemical balance that your neurons are able to connect in a way that, ta-da, you've done the science project by morning and you've turned it in. And damn it, if that didn't work once in a while, you wouldn't do that anymore. You'd start working on it from day one. You'd start learning this stuff. So you get this performative boost from that stress. But... That is just the performance. That is not the long-term learning. That's a chemical connection in your brain. You get a chemical connection in your brain when you first try something, too. You first try juggling. You first try playing guitar. You first try um, riding a bike. Uh, your, your brain is excited by the novelty and shoots through chemicals, and you do better at it than you expected. And you're like, whoa, this is going to be even better next time. And then it's not. And then your second time sucks. This is where we get this term beginner's luck because the novelty of something lets these uh, chemicals fly in the brain and gives you that performative advantage the same way that stress does, but without all the fear and anxiety and um, uh, cortisol 
and, and whatnot that's bad for you. But when you're relaxed and you're able to take in new ideas, that's what we're kind of looking for. We're looking for that beginner's luck that lets those chemicals fly the first time. But then to go ahead with the learning to where you start to slowly form those neurons closer together to make these synaptic connections easier to make in your brain. That's where you get the physical learning instead of just the chemical learning. And what happens there is a uh, dopamine. Dopamine helps connect these, these synapses at that point and not the um, adrenaline response. And the dopamine is, is the, it's the, the pleasure chemical, the chemical that helps you feel content. And it's the chemical that, that helps you learn. It's a good chemical. And when you're depressed, you're low on dopamine. You know, we've all heard this, this term now from our, our helpful, um, you know, advertisements for antidepressants. Um, but being relaxed, being interested, being engaged actually helps the physical transformations of learning happen in a much more productive way than those, those stress ones. So if you find yourself, you know, you're learning formally and you're in a class and the teacher's scary, this shoves you into that, that survival mechanism. This puts you on like alert. This ups your cortisol. And this might make it where when your German teacher calls on you, you're able to pull out the right conjugation right then and there. But unless you remember that, you haven't really learned from it. It's because you were able to, to make this leap in connectivity um, from being flooded with, with fear chemicals. And um, cortisol's all kinds of bad for you. It um, in, increases your, your weight retention and um, increases your sense of lethargy and all kinds of stuff that you, you don't want when you're um, trying to live a happy life. Dopamine's much better. So it's hard because the, the d way that most classes are designed is somewhat stressful. It's somewhat dictatorial and behavior is key. And, you know, having the right answer when you're called on is super important. And all these other sorts of factors that, that increase this feeling of, um, you know, low key danger in a class. When what we should be doing is be thinking much more like some sort of, you know, um, Enlightenment age intellectuals hanging out at coffee shops and, and chilling out and, and calmly taking on um, these new topics. I don't know that that's what they did, but you know, let's hope that that's something that they may have done and may have been cool if they had done it. Um, we want to be able to experience these things and bring them in and integrate it and, and then grow from it. And then you experience what we're talking about when we talk about being an educated uh, person, not a schooled person, but an, an educated person. This, this being able to expand your reference, build a higher sense of reason, a sense of reason that does not rely on the same brain that was fully developed 50,000 years ago while people were living in trees. Literally, that's, it's the same brain. That's what our brain is adapted for. For life on earth 50,000 years ago, that is the common sense that people are always appealing to. When people go, oh, just think about it, use your common sense. They're talking to your 50,000 year ago caveman self. They are not talking to someone who is enlightened and reasoned and understands multiple points of view and perspectives and, and uh, is emotionally aware and all sorts of other things. That 50,000 year ago cave self of yours was very intelligent and clever and knew a lot of things, but mostly it was about survival. It wasn't about empathy. It wasn't about systems, systems of government, systems of safety, systems of um, uh, regulation or fairness. Justice it wasn't about those things. So we have to hack into the brain because the brain is so capable and so flexible and so plastic. Like I said before, that there are over more 
possible synapses in your brain than there are atoms in the known universe. So it is extremely capable of thinking outside of itself. But you have to coax it into doing it. So you can go to your classes, you can perform, you can respond to the stress, you can do the things you have to do and check off the right boxes, you can see it as a task of jumping through hoops, and you can get the degree that's being sold there. Or you could be responsible for yourself, work on yourself. Instead of having all these sharp edges that keep you separate from the subject and from the, the knowledge that you're trying to attain, you, you're able to polish and smooth yourself out and integrate it into your experience. And then you're able to develop that sense of higher reason and work with a more evolved brain than the one that you came in with. Now doing both of those two things at the same time that's basically superhuman. Same thing with, with changing your mind, with accepting data that's contrary to what you believed, um, that's really and truly putting somebody else first and giving a heartfelt apology. These are things that people just don't do. But they can. They are capable of it. And that's where we're heading.